Thanks. Okay, brilliant. So yeah, thanks again, Mike, for an awesome talk today. Um, I've got a few kind of more general questions about your kind of path in science and thoughts on the field and things that we often don't actually get to ask and talk about, which I think is kind of is a shame sometimes. So the first question I've got, which I've asked all of our speakers today has been, what got you started in science and eventually moved into synthetic biology and bioengineering? What's, what was kind of the, what was the spark that kind of got you excited about doing this type of work? Yeah, it's a super good question. You know, I think all of us probably at different times, um, you know, you, you get exposed to topics, be it, you know, uh, at least from where I am, you know, chemistry, math, biology, and, and, you know, for me, it probably started in what would have been high school, the, the spark of, you know, uh, several teachers, uh, Courtney Lance, my high school chemistry teacher, um, uh, I'm a retain a biology teacher and others, and just kind of having that spark of getting interested in science and, and thinking about, about, you know, a curiosity for the living world, right? And I think that, you know, part of that stems um, and drove my, my interest and engagement to moving into potentially chemical engineering and biochemical engineering. I think as an undergraduate, um, Jim Liao, uh, who um, really is a, uh, an amazing researcher in, in control systems and theory and metabolic engineering, and has really made a variety of transformative advances, um, was the person who really encouraged me to go to graduate school. And I reflect upon that uh, many times, was actually debating between going into industry versus like graduate school outside of um, uh, my undergraduate at UCLA. And um, so I think in, in many respects, those individuals kind of got you excited about like the science and the possibility and the continued kind of lifelong learning that, that comes along with um, uh, scholarship. And, and those were probably people that at key inflection points encouraged me to kind of take the next step. You know, I landed at Stanford and I, as for graduate school, and I was really interested in the biopharmaceutical work. I had actually um, really got excited about um, uh, some of the work that was going on there from Chayton Kosla to Jim Schwartz to others, ended up in Jim Schwartz's lab and it was just the perfect fit. I think it got me excited about thinking about uh, biomanufacturing and therapeutics production. And of course, Jim had industrial experience at Genentech from uh, early days there and, and the advances made. Um, and that got me into thinking about protein therapeutics and how to make an impact on people's lives and medicine. And I think many of us probably have had people impacted by disease. And so it, it kind of all made sense. Wow, there's this amazing field of recombinant DNA technology that's transforming the lives of millions of people. How can um, I contribute to that? How can I make an impact? Um, and I think that kind of led, you know, one step in front of the other towards a variety of, of, of continued experiences and thinking about how you could use biology to make products to improve people's lives from the context of medicines to sustainability. Um, and that kind of led down the path to my postdoctoral works with Jens Nielsen, first in Denmark, then George Church at the Harvard Medical School, um, and connected us to where we are now today, where we think a lot about um, how can we use uh, biology, program biology, to address some of the most pressing and compelling needs of society, um, from you know medicines to sustainability to materials to education, um, and and I suppose that's that's how we are where we are. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, well, it's it's kind of fascinating to also to realize that a lot of these kind of grand visions were kind of laid out maybe two decades ago, like go in some sense, and now actually they're starting to come to fruition. We're starting to see some of the actual fruits of that labor and stuff, which is. Really oh, for sure. And, and, you know, it was fun to be, you know, in George's lab as, as Sinberg got started and, and also, you know, to see like the white biotechnology, industrial biotechnology advances that were going on when I was in Jens Nielsen's laboratory, um, just in and around Europe and, and that, that transformation as it was going on. So um, really been fortunate and very grateful to, to kind of be in the right place at the right time sometimes. So. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, so the second question I've got is, what, what do you feel the biggest hurdles are holding back the field at the moment? And do, do you have any kind of ideas of how they might be overcome? Or is, are they, is it just a, is it still an unknown in terms of how to get around these issues? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I, I think, you know, I think that there are a couple of things that we think a lot about. I still think um, continuing to advance and accelerating tools to make biology easier to engineer is needed. I think it's still hard 
and there are unexpected routes that allow us to not ask the questions we want to ask um, as quickly as we'd like to ask them. And so from my perspective, um, I think there's a lot of exciting opportunities in synthetic biology. Um, we are being drawn by compelling applications now, but continuing to develop the tools and having tool accel accelerators that allow people to you know, automate workflows, connect them to machine learning, um, and, and move through those engineering design cycles, I think is, is, is an opportunity that remains. In particular, as you think about um, you know, the design build phases have continued to advance and that testing phase for small molecule synthesis, for others, for um, whatever the function is we're looking for remains hard. And I think that that is something that's, that's uh, slowing us up a little bit. I do think part of it also is continuing to figure out what biology is good at um, in terms of addressing societal problems. So, you know, obviously the most profitable sector um, remains around biomedicine applications. And for me, what I'd love more than anything else is to see that really expand into planet and societal health. So how do we move into these global sustainability changes that challenges that I think synthetic biology and biology will be key to the solution of? Yeah, definitely, for sure. Um, and I guess you kind of touched upon it a little bit. So yeah, looking to the future, how, how do you think, so a lot of the impacts that we're seeing now in terms of synthetic biology are, are kind of replacing existing processes. But I'm wondering, what, are, are there things that are gonna be completely different in 10, 20 years time because we have these, these new capabilities, like you're saying, are there, what's the secret source with biology that it allows us to do, which we can't do with, say, standard chemical engineering processes or other types of processes that we, we currently use? Yeah, I, I think that's a super good question. Um, but, you know, I think there's probably a couple areas, right? So if we just take sustainability as an example, as an opportunity, you know, there have been methods and approaches that have been developed for, you know, um, carbon negative energy production that don't rely on biology, for example. Um, but I think as we think about uh, carbon negative molecule making, I think one of the things that distinguishes biology is its ability to make matter. And I apologize for the sound behind this here, okay. um, <laughs> but because uh, I'm realizing it's loud uh, from the neighbors. The, um, what I would tell you is that, you know, biology is so powerful because it's, it's not only information, it's not just the bits and the atoms, it's combining that information and energy, right? Um, and material building blocks to make matter. And I think that as we get to the ability to have carbon negative processes, carbon neutral carbon negative processes that make new sources of matter for us sustainably, um, I think that will continue to, to be a really significant and important role towards planet health, environmental remediation and others. Um, I'm wondering, I'm wondering if I need to move to a different room. Um, no, you're okay. You're okay. It's actually your mic's managing. Oh, okay. It's, 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 it's still moving out. Okay. out. You're okay. Don't worry. <laughs> so the other thing I think that's really important is, you know, as I look at biotechnologies, I think current access to a lot of biotechnologies for synthetic biology across the planet has been a little bit unequal, right? Mm -hmm. Largely due to bottlenecks in infrastructure and education. Um, and you know we need large centralized facilities to use biology to make stuff, or we have inequities in education that lead to inequities in capacity. Um, um, and and I think that one thing I hope, you know, and one of my wishes for synthetic biology is that synthetic biology addresses those gaps, that it creates opportunities to make biotechnologies and synthetic biology more equal, more equitable across the planet. Um, that it provides strategies to work without the needs of really expensive, you know, billion dollar facilities and, and infrastructure plants um, uh, uh, to enable the utilization of biology so that anyone everywhere um, can use the types of synthetic biology technologies that are emerging. And so to me, it would be remarkably gratifying if over the course of the next, um, you know, decade, two decades, et cetera, we see that transition. So, um, and, and, and I, you know, I think it's something to aspire towards. Definitely. I think, well, I come from a, a computational background. So it's kind of the open source movement has, I, I hope in, in a similar sense, like it's not just accessibility to technologies necessarily, but it's openness in the actual underlying technology. So people can 
build on build on things that are there without kind of worrying about being sued or or, or having issues around it. And I think a lot a lot of the, the things that are starting to sort of come out of of the um, of the community are kind of helping support certain aspects of that, which I think is good. And it's the literacy, right? It's and, yeah. and I think you know one of the things that we can do as a community that I think would have the most transformative effect is the literacy component, right? We all we all believe it's important to read and write. Um, increasingly, and I think now we're all on the same page, broadly as a global community, that's important to read and write in computer code, right? And I think we need to make sure people can read and write in DNA. Um, and I think like that transformation, that literacy becomes important for the, the field. And that's, honestly, it's, it's one of the reasons we were so inspired and have been working for, you know, ever since I started my academic career. Um, on the education components, we've been we've been hosting Chicago public school teachers in my lab every summer for for a decade, uh, you know, since we got started. And I think that that's these are the features that will really, I think, amplify the impact of the field. Definitely, definitely. Um, I've got one final question for you. Then, so um, do you have if there's a if there's a, a student out there that's kind of this, they've seen some of the work you've done and been a little bit inspired by it. Do you have any advice for how they might get started in the field? Are there any mistakes that you've made along the way that you wish someone had told you, oh yeah, don't do this or, or think about this when you're when you're going into to this area? So so advice for someone going into the area is the question. Yeah. I, you know, um, follow your gut. You know, I think, I think um, what I encourage people to find is find a home where they can innovate, create. Um, ideate where their values and, and viewpoints are respected that allows them to be the best researchers um, that they can be. And I think my advice is that that fit the match around, um, you know, student advisor relationships, group advisor relationships, the, the hum of innovation of, of university X versus Y and how that connects to how you know you can succeed is, is a really important um, dimension for wellness and being able to, to create and, and, and succeed in all of this. I think persistence um, and unselfishness are important. Um, and, and there are many intangibles that we don't talk about often as a community, um, that really can make all of the difference in being successful. Um, the only other point I would raise that I think is very tangible is, is work hard to, to learn the skills of presenting, um, to be able to explain your work to others um, in a very simple way uh, and in a way that allows others to access and understand what you do. And so those would be certainly some pieces of advice from just, you know, fit and match that allow people to actually reach their potential. But also I think as we move forward, um, being able to communicate our science is so important. And so uh, focusing on that element as well, along with all the other, you know, intangibles, you know, and, 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 and is important. So. Yeah, I think it's some excellent advice I would say there. So, yeah. So, so thanks again, uh, Michael, for the for the wonderful talk and for having these questions and everything. And um, I, I look forward to hopefully meeting you in person next time, which would be wonderful. <laughs> yeah, me too, Thomas. I, I I really look forward to that time. And um, in, until then, thanks for the invitation to be here today, and uh, it's been terrific. So. No worries. Okay, so I'm gonna.